Hey everyone, this is Mario again. It's uh, the second when I'm recording this video. Hopefully this video will be up today. If not, probably tomorrow. But I hope everyone's had a happy new year. Because, well, it's after the new year, obviously. So, you better not have had a bad new year. If you did, I'll get Christopher Walken to come at you with a soldering iron. And uh, I just had, had to do a random reference. But... Anyway, as you can tell from that title up there, this is my top 10 movies of 2011. Now, I wanted to do this movie before the first, but then I took an arrow to the knee. Well, yeah, and I know, I couldn't help but use that reference. I'm a LARPer, I've been hearing it a lot there, I couldn't help but use it. If you guys don't know, it's a, if you guys don't know, it's a Skyrim reference to something, to a glitch that happened in the game where you could kill guards by shooting them in the knee with an arrow. People have been using it for random stuff, like, I used to be a serial killer, then I took an arrow to the knee, stuff like that. Now, I already have, as you can probably guess from this video, I already have my top 10 list for good movies written down, and I have my bad list, more or less, written down, but I still got a couple films left to watch to finish it out, and then the rest of it will be subject to change, but it's also a top 10, but it was going to be less, but... <laughs> the other ones I put down and I'll explain why they're on the list when I get to it but I'm gonna do the top favorite films first which is what this video is now number 10 is a movie that uh, came out early this year and I saw it via Netflix instant I have to say it's a shame it didn't get theatrical release it's basically a film that the trailer told you just what type of movie you were getting in it's an exploitation movie and it's a fun little tribute to the 70s ones it is of course Hobo with a shotgun. I mean, if you look at that trailer, it does not really lie. I mean, not like Machete. Machete looks like it was going to be the same type of movie, but then we got a movie about the border. The border. I still enjoy the movie, but still, if you're gonna, if you're gonna tell us what type of movie it is, like oh, it's going to be an exploitation movie. Machete's going to kick ass, and he's hardly in the movie. The trailer lies. Hobo with a shotgun doesn't. Rugger Howe, he's there the entire time. Well, at least most of the time. He's a hobo that's not going to take it anymore because he's tired of seeing the corruption in this town. And he's taking a stand with his shotgun, delivering justice one shell at a time. You guys remember my review from a while ago, so more of my thoughts on it there. <laughs> now, number nine is shared by two films. I know it's kind of cheating to put two films together, but it happens three times on this list because of the films being connected a little bit. Number nine is shared by Blitz. And unknown. Now, Blitz, of course, you know it's a Jason Statham movie. It's one of the three movies he made that came out this year. Sad part is, of the three, this is the only one that did not get a theatrical release stateside. I don't know why, considering one of the other one, one of the other ones, The Mechanic, was a remake. I haven't seen it, so don't expect to see it on my worst films list. Maybe retrospectively, I'll put it on there once I do see it. But still, <laughs> Mechanic's a remake, so you know automatically that's going to get a theatrical release. And of course, the other one was based on a well-known novel, so you know that one's going to get a theatrical release. <laughs> Blitz? Based on a novel, but I never heard of the novel, but I have to say it's a sad it didn't get a theatrical release, but the other reason besides that is probably because there's a lot of British terminology in it. What I mean by that is that you can understand what they're saying because they're speaking English, but it's basically like as if you walk into a part of the world you don't really know about, you can understand what people are saying, but you still can't understand a majority of what they're saying. It's like that scene in Austin Powers 3 where they're speaking English English, you know, where they're using all the local terms that most people who like live in America, for example, won't understand. They'll be like, what the heck does sixes and sevens mean? Stuff like that. Now, of course, I understand some of the slang, but some of it I'm like, pause. Oh, yeah. That's probably the reason they're like, yeah, nah. It was actually made by Lionsgate, Lionsgate UK, and I could see that. And the only actor in the movie I really know is Jason Statham. But him and all the cast did a good job. And if I have to compare it to any other movie, it is the British Dirty Harry. That's how the movie is kind of set, because Statham is playing a cop that's kind of hard-boiled. You can tell he probably doesn't play by the rules as much, or bends them whenever he can. I mean, the movie opens up with him beating the crap out of these kids who look like they're robbing a car and they're going to try to mug him. He beats him with a bat. 
It's not a cricket bat, it's some other type of bat. <laughs> and then they pulled around on him like, oh, we were innocent. As George Cullen would say, no one's innocent. Your birth certificate is proof of guilt. Why did you beat him? I had a birth certificate on him, officer. All right, all right, book him. And, of course, the title comes from a killer in the movie called Blitz, who was killing cops. So, you see, you see why I call it the British Dirty Harry? It's both about hard-boiled cops trying to track down a singular killer. Only difference is how, well, the similarity in what happens to the killer. If you guys have seen Dirty Harry, you could probably you could probably gain a conclusion, probably, what happens to him. But it's for a different reason. I'm not going to spoil it, but I buy it. And Blitz was a fun movie to watch. I know it's if you have Netflix instant streaming, it's on there, so I suggest you give it a watch if you're a fan of Statham. Now, Unknown, you remember my review from earlier this year. It's a movie with Liam Neeson. And watching it makes me really want to watch my DVD of Taken, because yes, I still haven't watched it. It's a fun movie, you know. The trailer does not lie. It does not tell you everything, obviously, because if the trailer told you everything, there's no point in watching the movie. It sets up the basic premise of the movie, you know. Liam Neeson plays Dr. Martin Harris. He goes, he's with his wife in, I forget where in Europe, but somewhere. I think Sweden or somewhere. They're vacationing. He forgets his bag at the airport. He goes back. He's in an accident. He comes back. His wife is with someone else saying that they're Martin Harris. And now he has to figure out why they're doing that. And that's the plot of the movie. And it's an enjoyable movie. I mean, the action in the movie is well done. And I have to say, with this movie, Liam Neeson is starting to become kind of like an action guy. I mean, with Taken under his belt and this. And then, of course, that movie coming out later this month, Grey, which does look interesting. If he, if Gray is very successful, I could see him doing more action movies. I mean, he's already in that movie Battleship, which looks like it'll be a guilty pleasure of a movie. Uh, so, and I've always liked him as an actor ever since I first saw him in Star Wars. Yes, that was the first movie I saw him in was Star Wars Episode One. Guilty, that was the first one. But I've liked him ever since I saw him there. Granted, would have been better if he had a better script and a better director, but still. Now, number eight is connected to one part of number nine via its main actor, and that, of course, is Killer Elite. Now, if you guys remember when I reviewed this movie a while back, the trailer lies a little bit, but that's more of the way that it's edited than it's stating out. Because the way it's edited, it makes it look like um, Clive Owen, I believe it is. Or whoever, that one guy, I think it's Clive Owen, makes it look like he is... The one who kidnaps Robert De Niro's character, but that's just how it was edited. And if I remember correctly, it also does kind of make it seem a little bit like maybe the Shaw did it, but it's just a combination of the guy who edited it, editing it incorrectly, and audience assumptions. So it's it's not like Machete, where you can actually, where it actually how it's edited, it's basically stating it's going to be a, a revenge movie, and then it's not. So it's kind of both of it's both sides' faults with Killer Elite one. That's why I mentioned in my review for those of you who haven't seen it that don't expect. Clive Owen to be the guy doing the kidnapping because that was not true. But despite that, for me it was an enjoyable movie. It might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I enjoyed it. It's longer than Blitz, and Blitz is a more straightforward action movie where this one's kind of involves espionage, does have some action scenes. And on paper, you don't think Clive Owen would actually be good in this movie, but he is an enjoyable. I don't know if I would call him the main antagonist because the main antagonist would be the Shaw. But he's the main antagonist the Statham actually has to fight. And their fight scene in the kitchen is still pretty good. But it's funny how it ends with a ball shot. And a co he does a good job. But it makes me wonder how the role would have been if it had been someone who we could actually believe a little bit more fighting Statham on equal terms. But what it is, it's an enjoyable movie. I'm probably going to get the DVD when it comes out. I already have a couple tribute ideas for it. One of them, of course, involves a song in the trailer. And another one involves a song that I did a video game tribute for a while ago. Anyway, that's Killer Elite. Number seven is a movie that flopped at the box office. <laughs> I don't think it deserved a flop. And worldwide, it made back its budget. But from what I've been hearing mixed things about Warner Brothers wanting to greenlight a sequel. First they said yes, then they said no, and then they said yes again. I'm like, make up your minds! Because if they decide to not go with it, then the in then the sequel bait part during the credits is wasted. And of course, the movie I'm talking about is In Brightest Day, In Darkest Night, No Evil Shall Escape My Sight, Those Who Worship Evil's Might, Beware My Power, Green Lantern's Light. Green Lantern. 
You guys remember from my review a while ago, I enjoyed the movie. I thought Ron Reynolds did a good job. This is probably my favorite of the three superhero roles he's done, even though, like Hannibal King, the character's supposed to be serious, but he's kind of a goofball. But it kind of explains why he'd be like that. I mean, it seems like he's hiding a little bit of pain from what happened to his father. So, I can buy him being that way. And of course, it doesn't really help him when he first meets the other Lanterns, but with his heart, I guess it helps. I guess you could say, I steal a line from Hercules, a, a hero isn't measured by the size of his strength, but by the strength of his heart. That a little bit is shown in this movie, and I have to say, for hero movies, that is kind of true, that line. And of course, all the supporting cast does a good job. There's one thing I've heard that I think probably could have been done, is if they had made Parallax the only villain, because the secondary villain does a good job. He's like Parallax's lackey without realizing it, but he does kind of take away a little bit from Parallax, because Parallax is supposed to be this big bad guy, and he hardly does anything except kill worlds. The only thing he really does to Green Lantern is try to destroy his world and have that conversation with him at the end. And let's not forget that Parallax is actually supposed to be Hal Jordan. Evil! Evil! Every villain is Lemons! Or simply evil. And as you guys know, I never read the comics, so this is just watching. The only knowledge I have of Green Lantern before watching this movie is, of course, the Justice League cartoon. Well, granted, it's the oh, it's a different Green Lantern, but the concept, you know, the ring, Sinestro being involved a couple times, stuff like that, is still the same. So I do have loose knowledge, but not from the comics. So there's not really much to hate. And I did do some research, and I still enjoy the movie. Now, number six. It's a film series that came to an end last year. As you guys all know, the year before when the first part of this movie came out, which I think I just gave away what it was. My mother, I just want to close the door. I've been a fan of this series for a long time. I mean, this book series is one of the newer ones. It's one of the reasons I write. And I've seen a majority of these films in theaters. I wish I had seen all of them in theaters, but... I still have this film and the other film to get in my collection over there. And of course the film I'm talking about is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2. The culmination of everything the series has been about. And I have to say after watching it, if you guys remember from my review, I now see why they split the movie where they did. Because this movie mostly focuses on concluding all the plot threads of the series. Which, the time that they spend on it, I have to say it does work. It's paced a little differently than the first part, but... For what it does, I can expect that. All the actors do magnificent jobs like they did in the first half. Now I have to say, if I were to re-rank the series, I would probably put part one and part two, The Deathly Hallows, because I technically see them as one long Uber movie, at number two, underneath the first movie and before the second movie. Because you remember if I when I ranked them originally, part one and part two, the two Chris Columbus films were number one and number two. Number three was number three. <laughs> and then, of course... Number five, if I remember correctly, was number four because I like five a little bit more than four. But I don't know what else to say about this one. I already did a big long review, so I don't think I should spend too much time on it. I know not every one of my friends it's their cup of tea, but me, I've always loved fantasy ever since I was a kid. Harry Potter, I've loved ever since I've read the first book. I think it was the first book I read, yeah. And I have all the hardcovers over there somewhere. But I want to actually get some of the special edition DVDs of them. I don't know if I'll probably get those big Blu-ray ones, but I know I'll, I know at least for this film and the previous one, I'm going to get the same ones that I got for Expendables. Hopefully I can get them on Amazon, because now they're back in the Warner Brothers vault, copying Disney. <laughs> Number 5 also has two films at it. I know some people can say, oh, that's cheating if we're two films at the same spot. My list, my rules. Now the reason I put these two films together is that they do for their individual genres basically the same thing. They tell a good story, but they also poke fun at it and do some pop culture references to it. And that of course, and those two films are of course a film I saw last night, Your Highness, and a film I saw a while ago. You guys remember I reviewed Paul. Paul, of course, I'll talk about it first since you guys already know what my thoughts of it. It was an enjoyable movie. I thought Seth Rogen did a magnificent job of voicing Paul. Uh. Simon Pegg and then the other guy did magnificent jobs that, like they did in uh, Shaun of the Dead. The supporting cast did a good job. Sigourney Weaver is great when we actually do see her, but... Well, damn the microphone. But, as I said in my review, it's okay for her to shoot a human, but not 
as Xenomorph. And of course, all the references and stuff work well. Like his reference to Karate Kid whenever he's going to heal someone. And then of course the fact he was responsible for E.T., which uh, you guys all know well, uh, my buddy Mike OCP's feelings on uh, E.T. and the Steven Spielberg thing. I'm not going to get into it in this re in this video. I'll save that for when I eventually get to review Poltergeist, which that will probably be in a little bit because I have the film on my hard drive and I also have both of the sequels on Netflix, so maybe I'll do a trilogy review like I did with Scream. Well, we'll just see. Now, Your Highness, it's a fun fantasy adventure movie that it does do some of the conventions that a normal one does, but it pokes fun at itself at the same time. Like, like how many quests have you been on? How many quests have I been on? And then other stuff like that. I mean, some of the characters, the, the way they're written is kind of over the top. Like, um, James Franco's character, he's written like a Prince Charming, but it's an over-the-top way. And if I were to say, compare this to anything, it does... For the fantasy genre for adults, what Shrek does for kids. I mean, it uses the conventions and archetypes, but it does it in a fun, unique way. Like I said, it's the Shrek for adults. <laughs> Would be funny if Mike Myers was in a cameo role, but still. Now, James Franco, he does a good job as one of the princes. Uh, I think he does. He has a better script to work with here than Rise of the Apes. But then again, I see you guys know I still like Rise of the Apes, but I have minor problems with it. No, just. Ahead of time, it's not on this list. If it was on any list, it'd be on lists of films I liked. It could have been better. I don't know if I'm going to do a list of that, but I might. And then, I don't know the ma name of the main actor in the movie. It's the same guy that wrote the script, but he does a good job in the script as well. Natalie Portman, magnificent job. But the more acting jobs I see her do outside of what started her career... The more I see that she is a great actress, and the more I really do wish George had let someone else write the screenplays and direct the movies. George, you just had to be a control freak. Even now, you're a control freak. George, oh no, I just realized something. George Lucas is the Sith Lord. Oh, damn. What, which is he, the Master or the Apprentice? But if he's the Apprentice, then who's the Master? Oh no, don't tell me it's Jar Jar. That was... I would not doubt it one bit. Me said no be controlled. Ah, 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 ah. Did that a little bit too well, I think. <laughs> but, anyway. Your Highness, there's a combination of practical and CGI effects. I mean, one of the, there's a puppet in it like Yoda. I mean, the Minotaur is a practical effect. This guy in a suit. The CGI, like for this thing that's supposed to be like a hand serpent thing, of course, can't really do that practically. Oh, you can, but it would have cost all the budget. Mm, that's interesting. And then they, I don't really want to get that much into the movie because I do want you guys to see it. It's a fun movie. And it deserves to be number five on there along with Paul. Number four, this is the last, just to let you guys know, this is the last films on my list that share a double slot because I want to keep it to ten, but I probably could have done like a top 14, but I wanted it to be like a fit, uh, like a number that sounded good. A top 14 doesn't really sound good. I would have to put it at 15. But Anyway, these are two movies that... I like both movies. And uh, the way I was doing this was I decided to put them both at the same spot. But if I decided to put them one, I would have put the second film I'm going to name probably right below this one. And they're both Marvel movies that... I had apprehensions about the second one a little bit. Probably because of the actor. But the first movie I thought... It was going to be well, and it actually was well. And the two movies are Thor and Captain America. You guys remember my individual reviews of these movies. I don't have to go too far into it. But Thor was a great comic book movie. It followed the hero's journey a lot well. Uh, Chris Hemsworth did a great job as the title character. I mean, in the beginning, we see how arrogant he is, how he goes from that. He goes on his hero's journey against his will, obviously. And he becomes humble. Granted, it's done quickly. And he learns, I guess you could say the same thing I said earlier about Green Lantern, that a hero isn't measured by the size of his strength, but by the strength of his heart. He's humble, like I said. And he eventually becomes what his father wanted him to be. And of course all the uh, all the actors do a great job. It's the guy who played Loki, he's despicable as a villain, you understand his motivation. You kind of sympathize him with him for a little bit, but then when you see what his true idea is, that sympathy goes out the window. 
And of course, Anthony Hopkins does a great job as Odin. And I have to say, I'm actually glad to see him in a role that fits his age outside of horror movies. Because, like I said, I think he's starting to be typecast. Because most of the movies he's been in that I can think of off the top of my head the last ten years have been horror movies. I mean, Wolfman, a horror movie. I enjoyed it a minute, though. And uh, then, of course, that movie I reviewed that's not on either of these lists to write as a horror movie. Of course, the two Hannibal Lecter movies he's been in the last ten years, those are horror movies. Horror thrillers, more correctly, but... I can't really think of any dramas or anything off the top of my head he's been in. This is the only one non-horror that he's been in. And, uh, okay, I got another different message. Oh, yeah, it's my girlfriend. No, I'll let her reply to that message when I'm done with this video. And, of course, Captain America kind of follows the same hero's journey thing, but in a different way. Instead of a humbling one, it's him actually becoming the hero. Of course, he has to use steroids. Because if you think about it, that hero formula is a form of steroids. <laughs> but... Chris Evans, I think, did a good job as Captain America. Hugo Weaving was great as the Red Skull, a great villain. And I still don't really no didn't say I don't notice much CGI on his head. And yes, that's Odie. He's barking. He's a hell dog. And all the rest of the supporting cast did a great job. And it actually makes me... not I wouldn't say hyped, but it makes me look forward to the Avengers a little bit. And May can't get here fast enough. And now, uh, we move to the last three films. Now, the next two films I just saw in the last couple days, and I liked them the much that they'd be here. Number three is a movie that, granted, it says on Wikipedia that it's a 2010 movie, but that was only for one screening at an independent thing. It wasn't widely released until the last year, so I'm counting it as a 2011 film. And that movie, it's a drama movie that was directed by Robert Redford. I know, we're choice of director, but still, I think he did a good job. And that movie, of course, is The Conspirator. If you guys haven't heard of this movie, it's basically about the trial following the Lincoln assassination. Because the beginning of the movie just shows the thing involving not only the Lincoln assassination, but the assassination of... I forget what he was, but he was a secretary of something, his last name was Seward. And, of course the plan to assassinate the vice president, which of course we all know never happened. But the majority of the film is about the defense of one of the conspirators, which was uh, Mary Surratt, who was the only female conspirator. Now, or should I say conspirator, because most modern historians believe she was actually innocent. And of course the movie kind of does hint that she was innocent. And that the only reason that she was tried was because her son was a conspirator, which no one no one doubted he was a conspirator because he was Booth's right-hand man, but most people now believe that she was only tried for revenge, you know. Hey, if something comes out, we won't try you. And because she owned the boarding house, the plot was launched yet, so they're like, she must have known what was going on. Stuff like that, which, that's flawed logic if you think about it. Just because you own the house doesn't mean you're going to know what's happening. And, of course, all the actors did a good job. Uh, I'm going to... That's the only one I need to look up Wikipedia because I'm with actors. I'm probably going to... I might... This is why I might do an individual review on... Uh, if it goes into Darth Vader voice right now, let me know. Because it usually does that if I start something when I'm recording something. Uh, okay, uh, James McAvoy was uh, Frederick... Aiken, who is the main defense guy. Uh, Robin Wright plays Mary Surratt. That's right, the Princess Bride plays Mary Surratt. She does a pretty good job. I have to say she probably deserved at least an award nomination for it. Uh, Tom Wilkinson is in it as uh, Reverend uh, Johnson. He's a former attorney general, general who is uh, Frederick's uh, mentor and uh, the original defense attorney. Let's see. Um, even though we don't see him that much, a guy named Gerard Bestrom plays Abe Lincoln. Doesn't have any words, obviously. Um, Evan Rachel Wood plays Anna Surratt, Mary's daughter. Her, the son is played by Johnny Simmons. Um, John Wilkes Booth, even though he's not in the movie that much, is played by Toby Kebbell. Uh, let's try. Okay, Kevin Klein is in the movie. Now, this is what surprised me, because I did not see him in any of the trailers. I did not see him in any of the footage that was shown on History Channel, because they did do something similar to when 
Just like in 2010 when they released Robin Hood, they did that special called The Real Robin Hood. Which, when I get to re-review in that movie, I'll talk about some of the stuff that I think did. This one did one about the Lincoln assassination, which is how I found out about this movie in the first place, and which is how I found about some of the little details about this movie in the first... about the real story behind this movie in the first place. And, uh... He does a good job. He's kind of a dick. He plays Ed, Edwin Stanton, who is the Secretary of War, and he's the guy who's basically in charge of all the war stuff. And... He's a real dick, because one thing I should mention is that Mary wasn't tried by, you know, a jury of her peers. She was tried by a military tribunal. And this was because the Civil War was technically still going on at this point. I mean, Lee had surrendered, but there were still other ones, so they considered this an act of war. And also, don't forget that Lincoln had suspended habeas corpus. So, she wasn't allowed with that, which is, that's the reason I found out that the pre that President Johnson was able to suspend it when she actually does get one. So, I have to say, if it wasn't for that, I think it's... If it wasn't for that act being passed, she would have gotten off with that, but... That, but, I think that the fact she was tried by military tribunal it was just the government abusing its power and them looking for revenge. I mean, they go throughout that throughout the whole movie, and they even mention at the end of the movie that the following year, the Supreme Court passed unanimously that even during acts of war, civilians couldn't be tried by military tribunal. But still, we try to get around that, like with the Patriot Act. That thing, I think the Patriot Act is stupid. All we do is we're to stop terrorism. It's just, like George Carlin said, the American, American citizens will trade away a little bit of their rights just for the feeling of safety. Yeah, and then eventually we're going to wake up one day and find out we're living in an Orson Well, Not Orson Welles. Um, no, it's not Orson Welles. Um, we're living in a 1984 universe with Big Brother watching us. And the part of Big Brother in this movie is, pay, is played by the Republican Party. Now, why is Odie barking? He always is barking. All the noise, all the noise, 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 noise. You know, I couldn't help him. Now, there's one actor here I'm still trying to find so I can describe. Oh, yeah, here he is. I think this is it. I think this is the guy looking for. Let me check. Yep, this is him. Danny Huston is in this movie. If you got, if you guys will remember him as the guy who replaced Brian Cox as Colonel Stryker in X Men Origins Wolverine. There, I thought he did an okay job. Here, he does a good job because here he plays the prosecuting attorney, Brigadier General Joseph Hoyt. And of course, he says a line near the end of the movie, which is uh, countered, of course, by Frederick, which is a good one. I'm trying to remember exactly how it was worded. Something along the lines of, in times of war, justice is silenced or something. No. Let me go to the uh, internet movie database. Maybe I'll have it there. It is a very good line. And just, uh, by the way, Sam and I am due to say that this is fucked. You have to say it didn't really deserve to flop. It's probably because most people are like, oh, it's a drama. I don't want to go see a historical drama. I can't, I can't find it, but here's another line. This one kind of ser kind of uh, sums up the government's feelings for this assassination. One bullet killed our beloved president. One bullet, but not one man. I have a question for him. What happens if it had just been Booth? If Booth had decided to just do it by himself, would you have still bootstrapped people? It's a valid question. I can't find it, but it's basically his part of the line is that when war is there, that justice can be put aside, and that Frederick's retort is basically along the lines of, well, it shouldn't be. And of course, there's the lines. The whole movie is basically the. I'm trying to think how I should word this. There's a lot of sort of political law stuff in there but it's not like you wouldn't understand it because if you've gone through high school stuff you should understand some of it and uh, a trial they do talk about a lot of stuff around the Lincoln assassination the only stuff that is kind of skimmed over is the stuff everybody knows off the top of their head you know Lincoln was killed Booth escaped was shot in Garrett's barn stuff like that so it going up being skimmed over doesn't bother me and 
I don't know what else to say about this movie in this little video, because I probably will do an independent review for this later on, because I have some more thoughts to state on it. But from in conclusion, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it and you like historical movies, I'd say give it a watch. If you're not really into historical movies, you probably won't like it. But for me, I liked it. Redford did a good job directing. I'd like to see him direct more movies. The actors did great jobs. I'd like to see Ro Robin Ro White, Robert, Robin Penn get another one. Get a, a nomination for this role. Maybe some of the other actors. Really to show how the government can be destructive if it's given too much leeway. This is one major example. And the sad thing about this is this incident is kind of swept under the rug. Because I don't remember learning much about this when I was in high school history. Maybe I did, but I just don't remember it. But I bet in the history class I'm taking next semester, we're probably going to study it for at least a day. And I have to say, in my opinion, Mary was innocent, and she was just bootstrapped. Now, number two is a movie that, like I, like the conspirator I saw it the other day, and it's a fun movie. If I remember correctly, I think it also flopped at the box office. Let me check. Did I don't know why. I know it has a 6.2 on IMDb, which. Probably could be a little bit higher than that, maybe like a 6.8 at least. And, let me. Okay, it almost flopped because it made only a little bit over its budget, so that's just probably stateside. If that's stateside, then it probably made more worldwide, but if that's worldwide, then damn. Anyway, the movie I'm talking about is, of course, Cowboys and Aliens. You know, it stars Daniel Craig, Harrison Ford, Olivia Wilde, among others. It's directed by a guy named John Favreau, which I know that name sounds familiar, but I can't place it. Let me check what else he directed. Okay, directed Elf. Oh, he's the guy who directed Iron Man 1 and 2. Okay, I like this guy. In case you guys are wondering, I saw the extended cut. Now, the movie, it does really represent the, the West accurate, accurately when it's showing the actual West before the aliens show up. You know, the cattle barons controlling stuff, that actually did happen. Now, of course, I shouldn't have mentioned that the term cowboy is not a, is not a term that would be looked at fondly. It was basically a term to degrade people. So the only real cowboys in the movies are the guys we see with the cattle at one point. And other than that, there's no really cowboys, but it's just used as a term, you know, so we understand. Oh, it's about cowboys. And the title alone, I think, is why some people didn't go see it. It's like, Cowboys and Aliens. That doesn't seem like a movie, but it's a fun movie. Daniel Craig does a good job. Now, I haven't seen any of his Bond movies, but I know that you either like him or hate him, but this has me a little hopeful when I get around to actually watching him. And I will say, if they didn't actually already have an actor cast, I could say, I wouldn't mind seeing Daniel Craig playing Roland Deschain in the Dark Tower series, because he does, he did kind of hold himself a little bit like Roland is at the beginning of the movie, and with the gun even a little bit towards the end. Harrison Ford, he did a good job as the cattle baron. His last name is Dollarhide. Kind of funny if you think about it. He's a rich guy. His last name is Dollarhide. I wonder if that was a name he picked. He's a. They don't fully state it, but he's a war veteran. I'm gonna guess. I don't gotta check. See what year of the movie. 1873. So if I were to guess, I would probably say he's a Civil War veteran. It's 10 years later, so obviously he is. And he doesn't really like war, but he'll fight when necessary. And I have to say, I'm glad that Harrison is getting more roles, and he's getting roles that befit his age a little bit. I mean, it's nice to see him do like a role like Indiana Jones or something every once in a while, but you know he's getting he's not getting any younger, so him getting roles that are like mentor-like characters, because Galahard's kind of a mentor character at times, even though he does get out there and kick some ass. She's doing the same thing that kind of Sean Connery did. See, well, that's kind of ironic, because you remember when Connery was getting older, he started doing some more roles like this, you know, like Highlander, even though not that many people like it, I thought he did a good job as Quartermain in uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which was his last live-action movie, if I remember right. Now, Olivia Wilde, as you guys know, I'm a fan of hers. I liked her in House. I didn't mind her in Tron Legacy. Here she does a better job, though. And how her character is, I buy it. I'm not going to spoil what it is, obviously, because it's important to the plot, but I buy it. And, of course, all the secondary actors and stuff. Look. Uh, let me check. Um, 
the guy who plays Harrison's son, Paul Dano, he does a really good job. You can tell he's like a spoiled brat who's used to getting whatever he wants. Um, and I didn't notice that that's who it was at first, but Clancy Brown is in the movie. He plays uh, the uh, preacher, and I did not. I know he was. I knew he was in the movie, but I could. But I didn't look for him. I did not know that was Brown. I mean, underneath the beard and stuff, I could not tell. But he does a good job. Uh, let's see. Um, David O'Hara, Raul Trujillo, Abigail Spencer, and everyone else. Oh yeah, Adam Beach. I've always liked him ever since I saw him in Flags of Our Fathers, and of course I've liked him when he was on Law and Order for a little bit. So I'm a fan of his. I want to look up more of his work. And it may, and this movie actually makes me want to read the comic that it's based off of. And like I said before. With the title Cowboys and Aliens, what type of movie were you expecting? Were you expecting a movie that was going to tell you the meaning of life? I mean, even Monty Python's The Meaning of Life doesn't give you a clear-cut answer, so... I don't know what most people were expecting when they heard this title, so... I think it should have gotten at least $300 million, but still. Now, this next movie is also a movie that involves aliens, and of course... I know there are people that hate this movie, but I would be lying if I said I hated it. Because it's a movie... <clears throat> that one scene in the trailers, I knew what it was. I wish... I'm kicking myself a little bit. I didn't go and see it in theaters because I didn't think the movie was going to do well at first. But then when I saw it, when it came out, I'm like, oh, this is a good movie. And, it, <clears throat> and of course, that movie is Battle L.A. Now, on the surface, it, it seems it's kind of like your standard alien invasion movie. They invade, we fight back, we discover their weakness, we kick their ass. But the thing that makes this movie even better is, of course, our characters. Now, of course... Our characters that kind of interact a little bit like the Marines and aliens do. You know, you can tell that they've been <clears throat> in battle together and trained together. But, of course, they're basically like archetypal for the most part. But the one that makes it the best is, of course, our lead played by... Oh, damn, the name is escaping me. Aaron Eckhart. There you go, Aaron Eckhart. He, he's a character you can tell is haunted a little bit by his past. I mean, he did a call in Iraq that he... Hates because it involved some people dying. One of which is the brother of someone in the squad that he's going to be a part of. So you can tell he's a little troubled by that. And also another thing that troubles him is that his squad's being led by a green lieutenant. So that's one. That's another thing to have him concern combined with the aliens and stuff. But as the movie goes along, we see him become more of a leadership role, and he rallies the troops that are in his squad. And of course, as the movie goes, it eventually helps. And I don't want to spoil the rest of the movie, but it is a great sci-fi action movie. And I have to say, Aaron Eckhart deserves at least an Oscar nod. If I, if he wins it, that's cool, but he at least deserves a nomination for this role. If not this, I don't know if the Golden Globes have happened yet, but he should at least get a nomination there. Because they at least will sometimes nod people who haven't, who aren't nodded. Oh, freak, I forgot another movie on this. Dang it, I knew I was going to forget to putting this movie on the list. Okay, I can make this a top 15 after all. Um, okay, I knew I was going to forget put, to put this movie on the list, but I should have remembered because I wrote it down. should have written it down. But Sherlock Holmes A Game of Shadows is on this list. If I were to put it somewhere, modify the list slightly, put it put it between Thor and your Heine. Now put it between Thor and the Conspirator. I knew I was going to forget something. Jeez. Can't believe this. But, still. Anyway, guys, that's my list. I'm almost at the 40-minute mark. Glad I have unlimited time, so I don't have to split this video. Now, if you guys disagree with my list, remember, this is my list, my opinion on the movies. If you guys don't like any of these movies, that's okay. As George Carlin said, we're all different to each his own. So if you guys want to do do a list video, go ahead and do it. Now, of course, next, you're going to have my top 10 worst movies of last year. Of course, it's probably going to be another day or two before you see that video. Because I have a couple more movies left to watch. Pray for the 